Do I need to click on that? You don't need to click on anything at this point. But it's asking me something. The continue, yes. Go ahead and click on that. Okay. Hi, everybody. We're just getting settled in here. So we'll start in a couple of minutes. Shall we get started? All right. Yeah, sure. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you here. Thank you all for coming. My name is Denise Pennard, and I'm a volunteer with the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. I'd like to welcome you to today's program on California native plant seed collecting. Before we get started, though, um, even though most of us are pretty comfortable with our Zoom etiquette, our, all those little details, just kind of run over a couple of reminders for you here. Please double check that your microphone is muted. And we also ask that you turn your video off. It minimizes distractions and it really helps our presentation run more smoothly. Uh, for your best experience, we recommend that you use uh, speaker view rather than the standard view. If you have any technical questions, I'll be happy to help you with those. You can just message me in the chat and we'll get you on track. One little detail we've set up today is our live transcript feature. Uh, there's a button near the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you'll get uh, some real-time closed captioning. At any time during the program, you can submit, sub sorry, submit questions <laughs> in the chat and we'll answer those in the Q&A session after the presentation. And just don't panic about if you miss a moment, uh, the event is being recorded and you'll receive a link to that recording and the presentation within a few days. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the University of California Master Gardener program, but for those who might not be, we've been around for over 40 years now. We're all volunteers working in partnership with the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division of the University of California. We all receive comprehensive training and provide outreach and research-based education on horticulture, pest management, and sustainable practices for home gardeners in our local communities. And now that you know a little bit about us, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker, Janice. Go ahead, Janice. Oh, hi. Well, welcome everybody. And thank you for um, taking the signing up to take this class. We're really pleased to present it. It's a new class for us. So um, your comments at the end will be helpful uh, to help us make this better. Um, I moved to California from Chicago 23 years ago and really fell in love with the California landscape, which was very different from being in the Midwest and, and, and trying to um, find native plants because I had heard about the water shortages and the whole Mulholland story. And so at first I started gardening with native plants um, to mitigate for drought, to find drought tolerance. Um, but then as I learned more about these plants and then started to see all kinds of life in the way of butterflies and insects come to our yard, it was terrific for my kids to see that as well. And I just got more and more into it. Um, 
And so have kept studying uh, because it's so absorbing. We have over 7,000 native plants in the state and well over a thousand on the central coast. So you can never get bored and they're just amazing. So I also, in addition to being a master gardener volunteer at the um, UCSC Arboretum in the native plant garden and have just recently had the privilege to work on a very special project uh, with the Amamutsin Land Trust, um, which is to bring them back uh, in touch with their cultural, the plants that they used culturally. And we are in the midst of planting out um, 90,000 plants. And um, at least, at least uh, 30,000 have been done to this date. Um, so it's a real privilege to work on that, uh, which is up by Año Nuevo um, State Park. And, and then I am a member of the California Native Plant Society. I had formerly trained as an investment banker, um, but now I'm into seed banking and I think it's a lot more fun than being in the jaws of capitalism. And uh, there's a lot of parallels too, because we want, we, we really can see the importance of having diversity, diversification in our portfolio, but also biodiversity for our earth. There's no better investment than investing in plants um, because they are the first restoration ecologists in our world. Um, okay, so that's a, a phacelia, which is one of our uh, native wildflowers and it's such a great bee attractor. Um, and we have that out in our garden. And it's also a great cover crop. Um, next slide, please. So conservation is really important these days. I mean, I think we are all concerned about climate change um, and conserving our native plants is very key to creating a climate resilient California. Um, they're so important in supporting the insect population, which is declining. I think a lot of people don't know that the native, all of our native insects, which an estimate I heard is um, at least 100,000 different native insects. For example, people don't realize that we have uh, 1,600 native bee species, which is a huge number. And a lot of these insects and other animals um, co-evolved with our native plants. So while say a, a plant from the Mediterranean, another Mediterranean climate, may have similar drought tolerance. Um, it, they don't support um, wildlife and insects to the same level. Uh, many of our insects are host specific. You're probably most familiar with the monarch butterfly, which needs to have the milkweed plant and preferably a native milkweed plant. Um, without it, its population uh, can't can't be supported because it's they're eating the leaves. It's it's not about nectar. It's uh, it's about the the need to eat the leaves and the chemistry of those leaves is very important to them. Uh, and we have a lot of different plants that have a similar symbiotic relationship with that native insect. Um, next slide, please. So a, a really terrific book. Um, uh, on ethnobotany that I'm gonna mention because we can learn so much from how their re relationship was with the plants, which is vastly destroyed today uh, once their traditional methods were in fact outlawed. Um, the Amamutsin Land Trust, and you can learn more about it with that link there, is um, they are the uh, comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples that were taken to the Santa Cruz mission and San Juan Bautista mission um, during Spanish colonization. Um, and we, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the land 
uh, located in the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. Uh, the trust is working very hard today to restore their traditional stewardship practices on these lands, and which will also help them uh, heal from historical trauma uh, as there were many atrocities um, that happened during that mission period. Um, next slide, please. Um, seeds were very important food for them, native plant seeds. And uh, there are collections of these seeds at the UC Berkeley Museum of Anthropology, uh, which you can see online. And um, just trying to point out the quantity of seeds that they were able to collect um, prior to colonization, um, which has, you know, our, our landscape has been so quickly transformed um, with grazing and the importation of a lot of non-native grasses that just very quickly destroyed the, uh, the amount of these plants that were in the wild. And they can no longer collect a lot of these plants. Um, so this is buttercup seed. And on the next slide, you'll see um, a picture of these beautiful little buttercup flowers and you see that that in particular came from the Maidu tribe, which is uh, north of here. But California buttercup is a pretty widespread plant and um, does really well on the central coast. And you'll see it when you're out hiking um, and so on as well. Um, next slide. A seed food that you're probably more familiar with is chia. Um, the seed you're buying in the store is Salvia Hispanica, which is not our California native chia. Um, ours is Salvia columbari, and this map shows how widespread the use of that plant was. Um, and it's a really nice one. It's a nice annual wildflower that's super pretty to have in your garden as well. Um, I would also, this is another seed uh, from our, our uh, wine cups, which is a Clarkia purpurea wildflower. And, um, you know, these seeds also have a lot of different micronutrients. Our diet today is really, it has a far reduced palate than um, what they used to eat because um, they got food from so many different species of native plants. They got everything they needed from the native plants. Um, and this is just a picture of what these wine cups look like in cultivation in our garden. They, they are really robust when they're taken care of in a garden. So you can just imagine how much seed there is um, in those flower heads. Um, so sometimes it's hard out in the trade to find native plants. Um, and in fact, it was kind of the reason why we started growing plants from seed once we, once we had them uh, in our demonstration garden. Um, because then we realized how easy it was for some species uh, to be grown from seed and very cost effective. Um, and uh, for example, on the right, you're seeing seaside daisy. This is a terrific coastal plant that stays in bloom about three quarters of the year. Um, we're all almost year round able to collect seed from it. It's also a deer resistant plant um, and nice for most home gardeners because it it just has, it gets to be about maybe only two feet. Some people don't have a lot of space for the larger plants like manzanitas and ceanothus. Uh, so this is a perennial that you can have that's got a, a mounding habit that's also very attractive. And of course, it's a super pollinator plant as well. Next slide. Um, you know, there are, um, a lot of things that you probably have in your home uh, that will help you um, when you're out collecting seed. Um, and 
the native peoples, I would say, had all kinds of different baskets and seed beaters that they used and, and seed storage baskets as well, and baskets for winnowing. Um, and but with all the variety of tribes, you know, everybody had their own ways of doing things and you'll find your own ways of doing things too. And that's just gonna be great. You'll find um, what works for you. For example, I like to use, have a tablecloth handy so that I can spread the seed heads out when I'm separating chaff from seed and not have seed roll around. Um, so things like that around the house can be super helpful. Um, yeah, next slide. And just a reminder that the cleaner our seed is, um, if we're going to be storing it, it'll keep better. Uh, if we make sure there's good dryness um, as well and cleanliness. Uh, so at our demonstration garden, we are also seeing um, different various species self-sow at this point. And so that's a real good clue that they, those were gonna be easy to grow from seed because they were doing it themselves. Um, and without even seed being cleaned or anything, it was just all happening. Most annual wildflowers, many annual wildflowers are, it's recommended that you in fact grow them from seed. They, they grow best that way. Um, and uh, if you do that, you know, you can have your own wildflower bloom right in your own backyard or front yard. Okay, um, yeah. As it stands right now, you know, we would not want to encourage you to be collecting seed without some kind of permission and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, so we are, we are totally willing to share seed with people. And um, you might have friends that have plants, these, some of these plants in their own yard. And that might be another way that you can um, get some seed because you don't need a lot either in many cases, just maybe one seed head even. And then once you grow your own plants, you'll be able to share with others. And that's what we're hoping to do here. Next slide, okay. So it's important to collect seed when the seed is ripe. And that can be different depending on what your plant is. And as I said, we've got over a thousand different plants. So, um, you know, it may take a little sleuthing sometime to figure it out, but a lot of times you can tell when the pods get dark. And in fact, seed may be just spilling right out of them. If you look carefully, um, many are what's called dehiscent and they just burst open sometimes explosively you may have seen our state flower, the California poppy, doing that. Um, a lot of the lupins also do that. Probably if you've grown peas, you've seen that happen. And then there are others that are indehiscent. Uh, and you'll need to work a little bit harder to separate the seed from its surrounding. And we're going to show an example of that coming up. There are so many types of seeds, and this is not a comprehensive list. It's just to give an idea of the kinds of varieties of different seeds that there are. Um, but we're also gonna try to highlight the ones that are easiest to grow. Um, what's interesting, uh, interesting little seed fact are that say pomegranates are actually considered to be berries in the seed biologist world and citrus, are called Hesperidiums, which are berries that have rinds. But you don't need to worry about that. <laughs> Next slide. All right. Now, especially for a lot of native plant seed, um, the dryness of the seed is very important. Um, and that is their, their orthodox. And as they dry, 
they become almost waterproof. And so this is why, you know, you we have years when there's not a lot of rain, but even though there isn't, and we didn't have wildflowers the year before, we might have a super bloom in a future year when we do get decent amounts of rain, because a lot of our, our native seeds, they can last for absolutely decades in the soil. Um, and they have needed to do that because historically we have had long periods of drought. So they have um, evolved to be orthodox in many cases. In other cases, such as the best example is acorns, which really don't, their viability goes down very quickly. Um, I even heard a fact recently on a tree webinar that 10% reduction in moisture has a major effect on the uh, viability of acorns. So that's a case where you need fresh acorns and to plant them uh, as soon as you can. And then there are those that are in between and uh, they may not withstand freezing. And I just mentioned that because people sometimes think, oh, well, if I freeze it, it'll, it will, you know, we'll be able to preserve it. But no, you might be killing uh, some seeds. So again, it depends on what seed you have. Now, uh, we, we luckily have many seeds that are so easy to collect. Um, this is the wine cups. And it just really, once the capsule um, dries, it naturally starts to split open. Here, you're just starting to see it split open at the top, but it will split all the way down. Um, and, uh, and in that case, you know, we want to, you don't have to wait until, and you wouldn't want to wait until the capsule was fully ripe because then you might lose all the seed. The seed might all fall out. So that's a case where um, I will collect some seed and put it in a bag um, before it, those the capsules have completely split open. And um, that's something that you need to do with lupins and with poppies for sure as well. Next slide. Okay, viability of different native plant seeds really varies a lot. And this information is from the California Botanic Garden, uh, which is in Southern California. Um, they've done a lot of testing there. And um, on the right, we're looking at uh, viability results from our sages. The salvias are our sages. And you'll notice that say the salvia, the chia, which is salvia columbariae, um, is, has much more viable because it's an annual, largely because it's an annual. And our annual um, wildflowers have higher viability rates. Um, the sages are often then better propagated through cuttings. And we have a number of master gardeners who are just, they just grow the most excellent, beautiful sages, which will be available at our plant sale in October, which you will not want to miss. Um, and um, on the left side, uh, Aster ACA is the daisy family. And the daisy family is known to have, um, it produces a lot of seeds. You know, you're, everybody's familiar with a dandelion. Well, that one's probably got pretty high viability dandelions because, you know, it's a dandelion. But um, a lot of our native daisy plants also don't have uh, high viability. But in that case, uh, we would, we would um, encourage you to just sow the seed more thickly um, in order to get a decent amount of plants. So why clean seed? Um, first of all, like once you start looking at, you grab some seed and look at it, you, got, you look closely and you might find all kinds of little critters in there. Um, 
And so I tend not to want to bring that in the house. Um, and most of my seed cleaning, in fact, is done outside um, for that reason. And also because of the dust and the chaff and so on. But I think this is pretty straightforward about why we would want to clean the seed. And of course, uh, our indigenous people clean seed because they were using it as food as well. Um, but the other, an another reason though, is that we can winnow out less viable seed because basically seed with lower viability will weigh less. That won't have as, com as a robust an endosperm giving the seed weight. So when we're winnowing, it's okay for the lighter seed to blow away because it might be aborted seed to begin with. On the next slide. This is uh, our coast buckwheat. The flowers, the pictures of our flowers are, are on the left. And now we're on the right, we're seeing a dried seed head. Um, and next slide. And here are those little pieces of those, I'm not sure if they're called petals or what the exact name of them are. Uh, on the right are, is what the seed looks like. And it, it kind of slips out of, of the pappus of those um, little pieces of florets on the left. Um, and next slide. And here's another picture of coast buckwheat seed. Uh, this is a really cool website. This is part of the California Botanic Garden. They used to be called Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden. And this is um, where that, the information on the seed viability comes from. They've got an awful lot of information on their website uh, and a free download on native plant seed uh, and cleaning native plant seed and um, their methods with different species of seed. And um, this man, John McDonald, had been photographing native plant seed and you can go and click on different seed and see what, the, the, see what they look like. They're just absolutely beautiful photos and, and just so interesting at all the different shapes and sizes and colors and, and so on of our native seed. So I'm sure you'll all wanna hop on that after this webinar is over and go take a look at all those cute little seeds. Um, it's a really cool website. So um, this year I had masses of Toyon berries on my Toyon. And uh, so I read up on it and I thought, well, maybe, you know, I never got Toyon volunteers in my garden um, and I wanted to grow more Toyon plants. So I read that you would need to wait until the berries have dried. Then the seed, that increases the seed's viability. So those on the right are now the dried berries. And how we get to the seeds is by soaking them in water. And I only soak them for, I think maybe a half an hour or so, not very long. And that softened up the pulp so I could remove that just with my fingers and get to those seeds. And those very seeds are seeds that I planted. And um, next slide. And there's, the little baby Toyon, isn't it cute? That as uh, it did take about a month for that one to germinate, but I think it was just worth investing in that time. And here it is two months old, starting to show its first true leaf. <laughs> and it's just gonna be a terrific Toyon when it gets bigger. I'm sure of it. Next slide. Janice, do you want to show your other? Um, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, here. Stop sharing so that you can. Could... I don't know. Can we see this? So um, if you put yourself on speaker view, you'll be able to see Janice. Um, a little what? bit. Do I have to do something? Nope, you don't. I'm oh, OK. 
These are, um, we have this other beautiful little perennial called beach primrose. It's got the most gorgeous little yellow flowers, primrose flowers. And this seed I just collected and it germinated in less than a week. And you see, I'm gonna have to thin that out. That's a lot of beach primrose plants. And I had, we had gotten this plant from, also from our master gardener sale. One of our wonderful master gardeners had uh, propagated that plant. So maybe we'll have those in the future again. Okay, um, I do just wanna mention acorns. We could actually do a whole class on acorns, but the University of California has the most excellent resources um, of just, it's all way better. Um, and they just recently updated all of their information for the public. So everything you wanna know about uh, collecting acorns, uh, and growing, growing in a California oak tree is all right at your fingertips. And if you've got the space to do so, would really encourage you to do that because um, they're a keystone species plant for our state. And they support, because they support so many hundreds of species of insects and birds and mammals and so on. All right. When you are storing your seed, you don't want to ever put them in plastic. Um, they need to breathe, they need to dry out, and you'll find that if you do, you, it might start to develop a mold or fungus. Uh, and so paper, please. And storing not in like, uh, you wouldn't want to leave them necessarily in your hot car or something like that, in a, which I have done. Um, so don't do that but um, store them in a nice cool place. Um, and yeah, they can be stored in glass containers once they have thoroughly dried, then that can be done. Yes. Uh, next slide. Um, when I was during COVID, I ended up on YouTube coming across um, making seed packets out of origami. And um, I'm Japanese, so I love origami. And so I thought, well, this is really cool. And the other thing that I like about them is that um, if you can see on the picture on the right, the one that I, I use my PG&E bill paper to uh, make that one. And because of on the corners, they it folds, the top flap will fold over and really keep your seeds secure. You, and you tuck that top flap inside the lower flap. Um, and I have less spillage of seed that way. And it's, it's free then. You can recycle paper that I'm sure you, everybody has some in their house. I've even used big sheets of newspaper for the bigger seed heads and so on, uh, and just folded them into these packets as well. Uh, and then it's nice to have tiny little seed packets because some seed is so tiny that it's, it's almost like dust. And we do have a link to the YouTube that's the closest. Uh, I think that's the one I found that's, I actually modified the instructions a little bit, but that's the closest to um, what I'm folding as far as the seed packet. Okay, and the next slide is, so labeling. This on the right, I'm showing you what you could have, that's for, that's for uh, you know seed banking, serious collecting, um, but at least it helps if you can put the name of the plant because I've forgotten, and I think that I'm going to remember what the seed is, and I then I don't, and that's why I also found the um, the seed photographs helpful in helping me figure out what seed I had, but you really would not really want to do that because they also don't have photographs for every species uh, of plant either. So you, you might not be able to find a picture of that seed. So it's always good to try to take a minute and write down what you've got. Okay, now Calscape is a terrific resource if you're gonna be growing native plant seeds. And um, 
it's got if they if there is propagation information they have added that to this website as well uh and it's just full of information for um for look it says 7988 species of plants what's neat about it is that you can enter your address at even of your own home and it will give you uh, a list of plants that are likely very highly likely native or were native to your house and this button um i love this button it's the very easy button which will take you uh to the plants that are easiest to grow and they're easiest to grow because they are species that can adapt to a very wide range of soils and also a wider range of watering regimens. So in a way, they are gardener tolerant. If you have either forgotten to water or watered too much, they're very forgiving that way. Um, and uh, the other neat thing you can do is once you find a plant that you're interested in, you can add that plant, you, you can create that, uh, a plant list of your very own with this add to my plant list button, and which allows you to name your list and place species in it that you can then take uh, as a shopping list or a kind of like, um, you know, a wish list. Um, oh, I'm afraid, um... I've already created a list, so let's create a new list. Janice's <clears throat> uh, recommendations. All right. Yeah. So now I have two lists. Yeah. You can make many, many lists. So you have a list for your front yard, a list for your backyard. Maybe you have a different uh, microclimate. You know, maybe you've got more shade in your front yard and you need shadier plants. There's all different kinds of ways uh, that they've given you categories to, um, you know, help you select plants that are right for your location, for where they're gonna go. So um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, that's, I'm just showing you where the propagation information is. And the next slide. Um, this is a list that uh, this is a list that I made using that feature of plants that we've grown from seed that turned out to be fairly easy to grow from seed. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to continue to add to that uh, as we experiment further. But these are all in the very easy category too. They're, they, you'll find them all on the very easy to grow uh, list in most cases. So these would be also Janice's recommendations or the master gardener's recommendations. Next slide. Thank you. The propagation information came from the book on the left, the propagation information on Calscape. The book is not in print anymore. So, but never fear. Um, it, if there is a listing for it in that book, it is on Calscape. Um, but if you can come across a copy, it's a really cool one to have. Um, and you might find it in a library, by the way. Uh, UC Santa Cruz has it in their library. The book on the right is a really, has so many great tips on growing native plants. M. Nevin Smith is, uh, has been propagating plants in this, on the Central Coast at Suncrest Nurseries in Watsonville. So not only are these tips um, for a lot of different beautiful plants, really they're extra relevant for our area because he's grown them in our area. Uh, so, and that book I know is at, is at the library. So that's something you can go and check out, but it's a great book to own as well. All right. Um, I don't really do anything special when I'm starting seeds other than um, using new or sterilized pots to prevent the damping off that can happen, any fungu funguses that could 
um, kill your seedlings. And I, I just buy a basic seed starting mix that you can get at your local nursery because it's, it's nice and lighter and friable. It's a, it's a great medium for starting seedlings. Um, and I'm sure one of our master gardeners has a recipe for making your own seed starter if you're going to make, you know, if you need more bigger quantities of seed starter. Um, but I just, it's just easier for me to just buy the package, you know, for the, for the home gardener, for home use um, that's available at the store. It doesn't cost too much. Uh, and really for most of the native perennials, it's recommended to start them in pots versus just sowing the seed out, um, uh, you know, outside directly because the, the roots really need good development and, and it helps to guarantee success to watch the, be able to watch those seeds and take care of them more closely. Um, and also keeps them from the birds eating your seedlings that, you know, uh, they'll do that um, with um, a lot of the wildflowers as well. So, um, uh, annual wildflowers, by the way, though, as we mentioned before, um, you can direct seed. Uh, and the most important thing when you are direct seeding is to be sure that you have a weed free area. So summertime now when we don't have rain, this is a great time to be preparing a future site um, by removing re weeds. We sheet mulched out at the demo garden and that just has just been such an excellent, we've had excellent results with keeping, uh, getting rid of the weeds because um, the areas that we expanded the demo garden um, were just almost 100% weeds. And, and so that will, weeds, really gardening and weeding, you can't separate them. I, I can't men say, emphasize that enough. The, the weeds can really reduce your success with native plantings. So um, when also when I self-sow, it's really important that there is good soil to seed contact and a, a mulch of, sometimes I'll use small bark chips to keep the moisture um, in the soil and um, to make sure that they, it kind of gives them a place, the seeds a place to be trapped and not blown away. And um, I found that helpful uh, in starting uh, to grow our annual wildflowers. Okay, um, and I just want to mention the honorable harvest. Um, this comes from a book that um, that a number of us Mr. gardeners have recently read, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a New York Times bestseller, and she's really um, a voice for reciprocity. Uh, she's a decorated professor emeritus of uh, environmental biology at SUNY. University, and uh, she's a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation. Um, the native indigenous peoples always made sure to leave plenty of seed for wildlife. Uh, and, and they scattered seed. And in California, they also burned to clear, clear land from weeds um, and foster the future growth of plants that were so important to them for seeds and grains. Um, and so, you know, we can all do a better job of taking care of the earth and caring for all of nature. Um, and that's part of her message. And, and that was the way the indigenous people um, had that relationship with the land to care for the plants as if they were their kin. And, um, you know, in these days when we are concerned about scarcity with seeds, you can create abundance. And so that concludes 
the class and I hope you enjoyed it. And I think um, we have time for some questions now. All right. Um, I actually don't see any in the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that we haven't been able to answer already. Okay. Um, for the moment. <laughs> That's sometimes good. That, sometimes <laughs> that opens it up and uh, we get a lot. So we'll see what we can get there. Okay. Um, we can go and talk about the, um, we can talk about the resources briefly too, because there's, if you want to learn more, oh, you need to speak to this slide first, I think. Yeah, let's just um, speak to this slide. Um, so you're gonna get in the chat in just a moment, an evaluation form. And we encourage you all to give us feedback because we're always looking to improve. I personally think this was an amazing class and I thank you, Janice, so much for all your knowledge and your heart. She's got a lot of heart there. Um, Thanks. So that will help us with our class development, but you will also receive a follow-up email in a couple of weeks from the California Master Gardener Program. And that will be another short survey that will, um, it will ask you if you have used any of the information that you learned in this class. So what we do with that information is we go after funding. So that helps with funding. And um, we really encourage you to answer that survey when it lands in your email. Now I have good news and bad news. The good news is that um, Janice is kind of a genius. She plays a long game and she planted this native garden two years ago. And now we are at the point where we can collect seed in it at the demo garden. Um, so we have limitations to how many people we can have in the demo garden because of COVID. And UC is very strict about those. So we have a class coming up, it's this weekend, and it's on actually collecting seed from actual plants. Unfortunately, that is completely sold out. We're not accepting any walk-ins and we appreciate it if you don't just go by and you know help yourself to the seed <clears throat> um, on your own. Um, but we're hoping to have, because the seed will, you know, different plants will mature and ripen at different times over the next three months, two, two three months. Um, we're hoping to do this um, uh, several more times. So just keep your eye out for another seed collecting workshop. And um, we, are, we are also uh, working on a class for creating um, a garden playground for children. This is a class for adults, not children, but it's about turning your backyard into a botanical wonderland. We have an amazing master gardener to teach that. We have a fall gardening class coming up, no date yet, but it's coming up. So look for that. And we're looking for, um, we're trying to put together a low water use perennials class that will help guide you to the plant sale and um, your own shopping for drought garden design. We are also um, taking applications for a 2022 training um, to become a master gardener. So if you wanna be a master gardener, we strongly recommend that you do the application. There will be a process where you have to kind of attend a meeting so you know exactly what the expectation is in terms of um, uh, volunteering. And um, then the class itself is a six month program where you show up every Saturday and um, learn all kinds of stuff from very high powered horticulturists um, from UC a &R and other places. We hope to see you there. So Janice, want to take us through the resources? Okay, I think we've, questions. oh, and I just want to say, you know, I, I didn't plant that native garden all by myself. Nobody does anything by themselves. Um, there's been a, a lot of support from a number of master gardeners, and I'm just um, hope you you will though be able to come out and see it because it's yeah, it's it's, beautiful. it's really cool. Um, just some other books that are available. Um, actually, uh, yeah, and the Growing California Native Plants book by Marjorie Smith is still in print. Um, so that is something that uh, could be purchased uh, as well. And I think we talked about everything else and the Master Gardeners um, 
that there's a link at the end uh, had a plant propagation class earlier and there's a video of that that you can watch. Um, and I guess we've talked about the California Botanic Garden. And this, the document from the US Department of Agriculture on edible seeds and grains of California tribes was just such an interesting uh, short article to read because um, I really had no idea uh, until recently um, the amount of seeds that they had been able to collect and eat and use as food. Um, and then again, um, there's the information on the MCAT Anderson book, which has just got a wealth of information on it. Okay, I think that's it. We, we have some so, questions now. Great. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> Oh. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So uh, one uh, one of our people is uh, questioning about the timing. When should you start California native seeds in pots versus direct sowing them? Well, for some of the perennials, I'm starting them now because they do take uh, they take time uh, to grow. They take some of them take more time to germinate, and then as they get larger. I'll move them into bigger and and bigger pots uh, so that it's really, it's the roots that in the first years of native plants, um, the root systems of our native plants are so extensive that um, that for one thing makes them really useful for erosion control, really important for erosion control, but also that's a, a way that they deal with drought in having a more extensive root system. And that root development is really important uh, to ensure that that plant um, is going to survive once you plant it out. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to be keeping the, the plants in pots for very long because they're being babied that way and they need to adapt to uh, drought and wild conditions. So I'm trying to time things so that once our rains return uh, and reliable rains, hopefully, um, the, the sooner you can get the plants in the ground, the longer the time they have to establish their roots at that location uh, because they start to go deep. And so you may not see a lot of growth uh, above the soil uh, in the first couple of years um, until the roots have developed. And then, and this is so true, by the way, with, the, with uh, oak trees, uh, because uh, the roots of our native oaks go so far down. Um, and we planted one out at the demo garden too that was started from seed. So we're gonna watch it, but once, once, um, once the rains come, uh, I think sometimes people think that, oh, it takes a long time. It doesn't really take that long. And I think it's worth the investment for something that's going to pay you back so much in dividends in the future. So yeah, um, best to get plants in the ground with reliable rain. And if we have another year, where we don't have reliable rain, we will supplement to give them a chance. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about uh, using the little jiffy seed sowing things? Would that be something that would work well with the California natives? Or? Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. I've used those before too. Um, so you know, whatever. Yeah, to get to get them started, they would absolutely work. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So um, I don't know if um, you know for sure, <laughs> but uh, if, if there's a, uh, for this upcoming uh, seed collection uh, program coming up uh, on the weekend, uh, should people bring their own tools to be, um, while they're doing the work out there? Is that recommended? Oh. You know, if you like to, absolutely, you know, because everybody's going to find that they're, they're going to have their own individual ways of cleaning seed that they're comfortable with. So if you feel that there's something helpful, 
um, I would bring it and I would bring to um, maybe a, a, a dishcloth or something, not a dishcloth, a dish towel that, that has a flat weave uh, would be really helpful for gathering up seed. We are going to send a notification to everyone who has registered and paid for that class. I want to say one more time, we are not allowed to have too many people in the, in the garden. We want to keep having these events, so we want to adhere to the rules. So please don't just show up, um, but we will send those who are registered everything they need to know about attending and what they need to bring. Uh, I think for some of our varieties of seed too that, um, you know, I've started to package up some of it. So if there was interest during our plant sale, we yeah. could, maybe this is something we'll discuss, but could offer uh, seed packets for sale as well. I think that's a wonderful idea. And I think that's a great backup plan for people who want to get involved in this because we um, you know, do not know what's gonna happen with COVID. We, we may shut down these in-person classes again. You just don't know. Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, speaking of the plant sale, do we have any specific dates yet? I understand it's in October. We do have dates and I do not believe they're published on the website. Joy, if you are on, could you unmute? Oh, there we go, actually. We, we don't have a helpful have an official announcement yet, but no, I think Debbie's telling us that Debbie's on and she's telling us it's the 11th to the 17th of October 24. Oh, but well, no, it's not. Announced. It's in October, though. It is in October. Yeah. Let's and I know it'll be on our website and so on as we get closer to that. Yep. All right. Well, I think the only other thing that we have in here. Oh, wait. Sometimes they just appear, <laughs> the questions. Uh, so one of them, and this may be something that you, um, it's, it's a little bit adjacent to uh, the native um, plants, but talking about um, monarch, monarch caterpillars, um, uh, is there anything that they can be, for instance, moved to um, if they have decimated the entire milkweed in their area? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand Does the question. Of, of <laughs> so here, I'll just read it. So I had eight monarch caterpillars on one lone milkweed. They devoured everything. Um, we found two caterpillars later on a nearby succulent. Um, could they have been moved to any other plants? So a little adjacent to, to No, I don't today. know. I, I don't know, um, but I would, I would recommend going to the Xerxes Society website for everything monarch butterfly that you could possibly want to know. And I'm sure somebody there could answer that question. That makes sense. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we can put in our website here. We'll put that up on the, um, in the chat for that one. Um, any other good resources for buying um, seeds in the meantime, while we're feeling impatient? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Um, the Tilden Botanic Garden in the East Bay, which is um, another one of our all California native gardens, a beautiful place. They have volunteers that collect seed in the garden and then offer them uh, for a, a donation. Um, so if you were up in that area, I, I don't know, they might with COVID be offering them online, but that is the Tilden Botanic Garden. Um, and they're a terrific resource. And um, then there is a, a Larner Seeds is a company that uh, she's up in, I think Marin County. And, um, and by the way, that website, which I think we had on the resources page as well, is full of information on a seed collecting. Yeah, Larner Seeds website. Um, and you can buy seed there. And um, I'm trying to think of where, I think that there is, a, I think there was another outfit that's local, but I can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of them because we have 
bought, we'd gotten some of our plants for the demo garden from the Cabrillo College plant sale. Um, and they were using a source locally um, where they, because they were growing plants from local seed as well, except that with COVID, they canceled their plant sale. So I don't know, um, because the students grow the plants there and I think they couldn't have the students in person. So I, I guess that I don't know what they've got going on now, but they, um, they had, uh, lo they had gotten local seed, but I guess I'm not sure exactly where they got it from. Um, oh, there's some low, there is some seed at the UCSC Botanic Garden, not large quantities, um, but there is some, and there are some at your local nurseries. Well, for sure, poppies, you know, uh, and, but some other varieties might be there as well. I've seen the desert bluebells, which are so pretty, annual wildflower. That's one that you can more reliably find just at your local nursery. Um, and that plant is called Phacelia campanularia, desert bluebells. Or I guess desert bluebells is uh, um, easier to remember. And yes, it's from the desert, they're desert bluebells, but you know, with this heat and dryness that we've been having, I, th I think that, you know, they, they might work here. Uh, you know, especially if you've got a hot dryer, if you're more interior, um, that would be one that you can find easily. And of course our state flower, the poppies, poppies are pretty easy to find, I think. Um, they're kind of everywhere. So I, mm, I, I wish I could think of something else, but off the top of my head, that's, that's what I uh, remember. Oh, because, oh, California Botanic Garden. Yes. Um, you know, they're a major seed banking institution for the state. And they also sell seed. I don't know if they'll, if on through their website, you could buy it online. Oh, and the Theodore Payne Foundation, which is Southern California. That's the Theodore Payne Foundation. They sell a lot of seed. Theodore Payne um, was one of our earliest native plant pioneers and seed collectors. All right. <laughs> so there've been a couple questions uh, that came in about timing. Uh, both on direct selling uh, uh, wildflowers, and then also what kind of timing there might be for cuttings. Plants would do better with cuttings. For cuttings? Um, okay, for cuttings, that's not my area of expertise. I, I'm sure, I know we've got master gardeners uh, around that are really, really good at that. So I hope that they'll answer that question. They may be doing cutting now. Um, as far as timing for wildflowers, here's what I, this is a strategy that comes from investing, is that you don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket. So I will sow some seed, but at different times because we cannot predict our rainfall. So you don't wanna sow all your seed all at once. I, I, I don't do that because say the rains come, and then the seedlings, your little wildflower seedlings pop up and you see them, but then we go into a period of dry, hot weather that can happen, you know, in the fall and um, they'll dry up right away and die or, you know, they, some are going to be eaten by birds and so on. So I'll sow, try to sow seed several times and always, when I know that in the weather report, they're saying that we're going to have good periods of rain, you know, not like a single, like I wouldn't plant out seed from our first rainfall. I will wait until the ground has soaked in more moisture. And the weather says that we're going to have maybe a a system of rains coming through, that's going to improve your chances of having the seed germinate. And then again, I can't say enough about protecting them with a little bit of mulch um, so that they don't, wind could blow them away if we get 
you know, a dry spell and we get terrible winds. Um, even rocks, like rocks can help and other native plants can help trap wildflower seeds too. So it's always, it's nice to have a mix um, in your garden. It's a little bit of biodiversity. Then your, your eggs aren't all in one basket and you'll have some level of success with them. So I'm gonna step in and say that we are over time. And um, the vast majority of people who logged in in the beginning are still with us. Good job, Janice. <laughs> um, there are a lot of recommendations and resources that came in through the chat. So we'll scan that um, after class and send it out with the presentation. So you guys have those too. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Denise, for being the master of ceremonies. And Janice, thank you for your knowledge. Oh, no, it was a pleasure. And I just, I do hope that it was helpful. Um, and we do have a uh, hotline for additional questions, but there's, there's a lot, a lot of information out there. And with COVID, there were so many wonderful YouTubes out there on growing California native plants. And that was terrific. That was kind of a good thing with COVID. I always have a hotline slide, but I didn't include it. <laughs> so <laughs> our website has a hotline for all kinds of questions. So if you have questions, try that. All right, everybody, you guys have okay. a good evening and we'll see you at the next class. Thank okay. you. Bye.